Good morning. My name is Pastor Jamie Lane, and I'm the pastor here at Parkway Church in Woodbridge, Virginia. I'm so excited that you're joining with us online, even though we're unable to meet in person. If this is your first time visiting with us, if you could do us a favor, please text the word WELCOME to 703-590-5199. We'd love to be able to connect with you, let you know that we're praying for you, and give you an ability to respond back to us if you have any questions about our church. We, this morning, though we're not able to be in person, are still here to worship the Lord. We're here to sing praise to, the, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're here to lift up the name of the Lord, even in our homes, those separated by distance, we are together with our brothers and sisters in faith. I'm praying that today's message will speak to our hearts and that our hearts might be turned back toward the Lord so that we can trust Him more deeply. Will you pray with me this morning as we begin our service? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come into Your presence now, Lord. We thank You, Lord, for this day that You've given us. A day where we could set aside all of the cares and things of this life, and we could focus on You and You alone. In our time together, may we worship the Lord. In our time together, may we hear from Your Word. In our time together, may You speak to our hearts. 
May you open our eyes and open our ears to your truth, that we might walk in your paths of righteousness. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, let us stand this morning in our homes, and let us worship the Lord.
together.
Amen. Well, in just a moment, we're going to sing our next song. But until then, I wanted to give you just a, a little message to our uh, regular attenders and our members. Your continued faithful giving to the work here at Parkway Church has enabled us to keep the lights on, so to speak, pay our employees, and to be able to meet our obligations as a church. Your faithfulness during this time means that we're able to continue to operate here as a church and do the kind of work and ministry that God has called us to do. And so I want to say thank you. There are four ways that you can give this morning if you would like to. The first way is you can give in person. You can come by the church between 9 and 4, Monday through Friday, and drop off your offering envelope. You can also mail in your offering if you would like to. We can certainly take it that way. Also, you can give online on our website, trytryparkway.com. Click on the Giving tab and you can give securely on our website, either through our online giving portal or through PayPal. You also can give through the app, Church Center, is what you would look for in your App Store or Google Play Store, Church Center. Once you download the Church Center app, you will look for Parkway and you can log in and give securely that way as well. Or you can text any amount of your offering from your cell phone to the number 84321. That's uh, any amount in the text message body to the phone number 84321. And that amount, will you'll get a link and you'll be able to give that way. Again, thank you for your continued giving during this time. Persecution, rage, and flame still. 
Good morning. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. I thought it was a good idea over the next few weeks before we're able to come together in person to set our minds back to thinking about the promises of God. Setting our minds to how do we know for sure God has uh, our back, that He knows what we're going through, that we can endure every trial that is placed before us. How can we have a peace even in the middle of a storm or pandemic? How can we, who uh, seemingly every time we turn on the nightly news, are bombarded with images and with uh, death counts and all of the rest, how can we find a calm peace and assurance during that? And so over the next few weeks, I'd like to continue to explore some of the awesome promises of God. I want you to remind, be reminded that all of God's promises, every time He opens His mouth, and every time He says, this is the way it will be, that He is making a promise that you can take to the bank, that you can 100% stake your life on. Everything God says is true. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to wonder if it applies to you. You don't have to say, well, uh, maybe it applies to others, but it doesn't apply to me. No, God's precious promises are for you. And I want you to have that calm assurance this morning. In Isaiah chapter 43, we're going to begin looking at the first few verses. But before that, I want to give you some context about uh, the verses we're about to read. You'll notice if you have your Bibles open that in Isaiah chapter 42, uh, my Bible tries to help me out with headings. And in those headings, you know, they're not in the actual text, but they help you understand what's going on. And the heading right before I come to Isaiah 43, my Bible says, Israel's obstinate disobedience. I like that phrase when I read it. Basically, what Isaiah 42 ends in is a call to judgment. That because of the disobedience of Israel, because of the disobedience of God's people, God is going to bring a measure of judgment upon them. And rightly, they deserve it. After all, in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah is called into the ministry, he asks the Lord, how long will I go and minister to these people? And what will it be like? God looks at Isaiah and says, Isaiah, you're going to spend your whole life ministering to these people. And I want you to know they're not going to have ears to hear. They're not going to have eyes to see. Their minds and hearts will be hardened to the truth. In fact, you won't see a whole lot of fruit from your ministry. But I do want to make you a promise that there will be some who will believe. They will be like a remnant, like a tree that's been cut down, and from the stump of that tree comes a tiny little sliver of life, a small little branch, a small little seedling that comes out of the stump. That will be what it will be like. It won't be a colossal giant oak tree that you can look at and marvel and say, look how big, look how grand, look how marvelous. It'll be some very weak, very small, very tender offshoot. But I will protect it. And so when we come to Isaiah 42, it's no doubt that the people have rejected the message of God. That every time Isaiah stood before the people and said, Thus saith the Lord, that they rejected his message. They did the same thing that Adam and Eve did when Adam and Eve decided to disobey God. They said, You know what, God, we know you said don't, but we think we know better than you do. And so we're going to make our own decision on what is right or wrong. And in doing so, they chose to disobey the Lord. 
Well, we didn't come very far from our spiritual and physical um, uh, parents, Adam and Eve, who the Bible says caused all of mankind to plunge into sin, all because one man sinned. And so, Isaiah is preaching, Isaiah is ministering, and there's disobedience on every face. And then God in Isaiah 43 gives a promise, a promise that I would love to share with you. Notice in verse 1, But now thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I think it would be good if we would stop there for just a moment and think about this word redemption and what it is that God is saying when He uses the word redemption. Now, if you've studied the Bible for a while, you may know this, and this may be old news to you, but let, let us hear it as fresh as we can. The Bible, since Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man, is a story about how God is going to restore a sinful people. That the whole world is full of sin. Just like in Noah's day, when God looked out and saw that there was wickedness everywhere. God looked out into the world and He saw that it was wicked. It was far from the perfect creation that He had made and started in the Garden of Eden. That sin had so corrupted nature, sin had so corrupted relationships, sin had so corrupted life here on this planet that He created and called very good. Well, it needed a Savior, it needed to be bought back. It needed to be restored and redeemed. So it is God's message from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the New Testament where we see the unraveling of God's plan. A plan, by the way, that the Bible says was started in motion before the very foundations of the world. A plan to redeem a people who are sinners. You say, well, I don't really like that title, sinners. Well, it's just a biblical phrase. A sinner is someone who transgresses or commits a sin. A sin is anything that goes against the character of God. What God has decreed is always right. Man has chosen to say, well, I don't know if I'm going to do that or not. Or maybe God has decreed that it is wrong. And man says, well, I don't know if it's so wrong. In my eyes, I think it might be okay. God lays out His measuring stick in the Old Testament, there are laws that are given by God. Ten of them given to Moses on the mountain, such as only have one God before me, and don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery. All of which, if we were to go through them one by one this morning, I can guarantee you that you would find that you have broken at least one of God's laws. And if you've broken one of God's laws, the Bible says that you're a sinner. And that rightly, justly, a sinner is to be punished. I'm a parent. I know this all too well. That if you commit an infraction, if you commit a sin, if you disobey in my house, that there will be punishment. There might be something taken away, taken away from you. There might be, you know, some grounding, some, you know... Um, uh, punishment that is going to teach you not to do it again. Well, in God's plan, a sinner deserves judgment. And the judgment that Almighty God has decreed for the sinner is eternal separation from Him. In a place that He did not design for man, but that He sends man in response to our willful behavior. 
And in our sin, God judges us. And so, again, the Bible from Genesis 3 all the way up is looking for that place of redemption, that place of redeeming, buying back mankind from the sin of this world. Let me just say, the Bible says in the New Testament that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I don't know about you, but I've thought about that verse quite a bit. I didn't love Jesus. I didn't love God. But God looked into the future. He saw me. He saw you. And He knew that because of our sin, the only right punishment would be His pure and swift wrath. But He loved us so much that He would send His only Son to die for us so that if we believe in what Jesus does for us on the cross, we would be saved, rescued. Not have to go through that terrible pain of separation from God, eternally away from Him. But that we could be restored and made new, bought back from the world. And we would be restored as sons and daughters of God. Once enemies... Now he invites us to sit at his table. I often think about it this way. If you were to get a speeding ticket or you were to commit a crime and you were to go into a courtroom, and let's say for a moment that Jesus is your attorney, and of course you pay your attorney so that you can avoid the penalty, right? They can find some legal loophole or they can, you know, work some, some legal magic and, and get the case dismissed. Maybe the officer forgot to sign his name or wrote the wrong date or something like that. And on a technicality get you off the, uh, the hook for your sin, your, your crime, even though you deserve it. But Jesus, as your lawyer, He doesn't look for a technicality in the law. Because the law doesn't allow for sinners to be redeemed, to be bought back, to be made in right standing before the Almighty God. Unless, of course, there's been a sacrifice made. Blood that has been spilt on behalf of the offender. And Jesus, being the lawyer, you would think He would stand before God, the Almighty, the judge, and say, Lord, don't look at the accused and think Him guilty. No, no. He's innocent. No. Jesus looks at the Almighty judge of the universe and this is where Jesus would not be a very good lawyer. He says, Judge, you've read every one of his crimes, and he's guilty of every one of them. Throw the book at him. Give him the harshest punishment available. Now, take a second to think about that. And then, consider that Jesus, your attorney, says, But judge, when you throw the book at him, know that I'm going to pay that debt, that penalty, that punishment. And I want you to credit him with my sacrifice. And the judge says, okay, you're guilty, but your punishment has been laid on another, so you're free to go. My friends, that is precisely 
what Jesus does for us. My sins were laid on Him. He took my sins and your sins to the cross. And now in God's eyes, I have been justified, made right in His eyes. The legal ramifications of my sin have been satisfied. I've been redeemed, bought back from this life of sin in this world. And I have been made a son of the Almighty God. So when God says here in the text, Fear not, I've redeemed you. One of those things I want to kind of ring in your ear this morning is that He has redeemed you. If you know who Jesus Christ is, you have been bought back from the world. Don't have any fear. The greatest need of your life has been taken care of. You are a son or daughter of the King. Notice what else it says, I have redeemed you and I have called you by name. You are mine. Verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So that's the full text that we're going to study this morning. The promise that we're going to see laid out over the next few minutes is simply this. We cannot be defeated because God is watching us. We will not be defeated. That's a pretty serious word, defeat. We talk about it in a lot of different areas in our culture today, defeating uh, one team on a field being defeated in life, finding despair, despondency. It's pretty serious. When we think about it in a personal way, I feel defeated. The first thing he says that will not overtake us, he talks about water. Water is one of those elements that certainly comes in and destroys and uh, we can think about it with flooding, we can think about it with torrential rains, we can think about it with hurricanes or tornadoes that comes in and damages homes and causes damage that way. Water is quite damaging and sometimes uh, we feel like we are in the waters of life and that at any moment the water is going to overtake us and we are going to drown that the waters are sweeping ever so swiftly, and we seem to be powerless in the middle of its current. But I'm telling you that God's Word has declared that He knows who you are, He's watching over you, and that the waters, even though you go through difficulty, will not be so great that you will be swept under. The second element that the text talks about is that of fire. Fire, I would say, would be a very symbolic, symbolic of pain, symbolic of hurt, burning away. I would say to you this morning that this morning you might feel uh, burned. You might feel the pain of hurt in this life. Notice the text says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. Through fire you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. You will not be defeated. And I love what Isaiah 54, 17 says. If you'll turn there for just a second, you can see it right there in your Bibles. Isaiah 54, 17. You might know it off the top of your head too. It's a pretty, uh, one of those famous verses. Uh, notice here in the text it says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. There's not anything in this life that's going to come against the child of God that is going to win. We will not be defeated. Now you say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that a child of God can't get cancer and be defeated that way? No, no. I'm telling you, you can still get victory even though you might be going through cancer. You say, well, I got a pretty financial hit. Uh, that's a defeat. No, you can have victory in the middle of a financial disaster too. 
It, just like you can have victory in the middle of this coronavirus. We're going to talk about that in a moment. God is watching. I want to remind you that God sees every single thing. His eyes are upon you. Now that might worry some of you this morning. You might say, well, the eyes of the Lord are upon me. He's judging me. He's waiting for me to slip up like a little ant. He just wants to crush me under the weight of his boot. Or he wants to keep me in the dust, keep me into the dirt. Maybe uh, kick me while I'm down type thing. But I want you to hear what the Word of God says when it says the eyes of the Lord are watching. Proverbs 5.21 For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and He ponders all His paths. God does not sleep, nor does He slumber. He is always looking after us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12 For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. He, his ears are always open to their prayers. His eyes are upon you. His eyes are upon me. This isn't some universal gaze where I'm saying that God sees everything. I want you to personalize it. God is watching after you. God cares for you. He knows about your circumstances. He knows about your problem. He knows about your life. He, he sees it all. And take comfort in these words. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to Him. 2 Chronicles 16.9 he is searching for a people to bless. Searching for a people who need His strength. He's searching for a people that on their behalf He can be the strength that they need. He's searching for a people who are loyal, Second Chronicles says. And in Genesis 6, 8, it is Noah who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah's one of those characters where I often think about it in this really strange you know, way. The same waters that come down to destroy and bring judgment are the same waters that lift Noah and his family in the boat to safety. The same currents that are sweeping judgment upon others are the same currents that move Noah and his family along in the water in that boat of safety. Some view God as if God is just waiting to pounce on them, waiting to bring down wrath and judgment. But I want you to know, wrath and judgment will come from the Lord, but you can be spared from it if you have been redeemed, bought back from this world, if you've been saved and rescued, you don't have to worry about the judgment of the Lord. You can rest in the calm assurance and in the promises of God that He's watching over you not to wait for you to uh, fall and then there is the hammer of justice. But He is waiting to see that when you fall that you turn to Him and He helps to lift you up from that place, dust you off, and walk with you throughout the rest of life's challenges. In God we find forgiveness. In God we find hope. In God we find restoration. Delight yourself in the Lord. And He will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37, 4. God loves you. And when you delight yourself in Him, He will give you the desires of your heart. You see, God's not waiting and watching to see when you mess up, when you disappoint Him. This is a beautiful gift. 
He's watching over you for protection. He's watching over you for concern. He's watching over you to ensure your continued safety, to help you in your time of trouble. Notice, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, thou shalt not overflow you. I think every, well, I, let me put it this way. I think if you hear that phrase in your mind and you think about it from a Jewish perspective, one of those stories that you would kind of come back to, and I talked about this last week, is the story of the Red Sea, where Pharaoh's army is chasing after the Israelites after they've escaped uh, from Egypt. And Pharaoh said, yeah, you can go, but then he changes his mind. And they look out at the Red Sea, and it's impassable. It's not something they can swim through. It's not something they can walk and wade through. They have elderly and women and children who might not be strong enough to get across. And even the men probably aren't strong enough to, to go across. Um, and all this, all this time, Pharaoh's chariots and soldiers is racing toward them. And it is God who sees them through the waters. Just like this promise says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. I want you to think for just a moment, if we apply this verse to our lives, that what God is promising you is just like I can part waters and that's nothing for me, just like I can let people walk across on dry land, just like I can rescue people from imminent destruction and death, I can be with you. That you might feel like you're drowning, but with me by your side you will not succumb and be defeated. The next phrase in the verse says, When you walk through fire you shall not be burned, nor will the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. What comes to mind when I think about those verses is the story that comes to us in the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 3, we uh, come into an uh, encounter, uh, three uh, Hebrew uh, men, young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They refused to bow down to the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had established. And for that, they were um, thrown into a fiery furnace. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar was so incensed, so angry that these three Hebrews had decided not to bow down to him, that he ordered that the furnace would uh, be increased in heat. And the Bible even gives us a little picture about what that means. The men who were charged with throwing these three Hebrews into the fire, they found themselves uh, d dead because the heat was so intense that when they got close enough to toss them in, they themselves died. These Hebrews were bound and thrown into the fiery furnace. And it is Nebuchadnezzar who looks into this hazy flame of fire and says, Are my eyes deceiving me? Hold on a second. Didn't we throw three into the fire? But now I see four. And the fourth man looks like the Son of God. The Bible says that those Hebrew children came out of the fiery furnace. And the Bible says that they were unbound. They didn't even smell like smoke. There wasn't one hair on their head that was singed. Even though Nebuchadnezzar meant it for evil, even though he meant it to kill them, the Bible says that God was with them in the fiery furnace. They were not defeated that day. Let me give you the flip side of that story, and let me help you if during this whole message you said, yeah, but, yeah, but, oh, that's great, but. 
Surely we've been defeated in life. Surely there are times in life where we don't always come out the winner. Here's something I want you to hang on to. These children of God, they declared before they ever went into the furnace, we don't know if we're going to be saved or not. Meaning, if we go in, I don't know if God somehow is going to do something so that we don't die in that fiery furnace. And if, we're, if we go in and we come back out, I want you to know it's not because of us. It's because of God's work. But we also want you to know this. If we walk into that fiery furnace and we die there, it does not mean that our God is not able. It does not mean that our God is not strong enough. And it does not mean that somehow our God is asleep or slumbering or on vacation or does not care about us. Our God is not defeated by any scheme of man. And if we die in this life, we know we'll see God in the next and if it looks like we've been defeated, don't give it a second thought. Because God cannot be defeated. And so let me tell you that there will be opportunities in our life where it will seem like we've been met with personal defeat. We may, uh, maybe are suffering from the consequences of our own sin or not listening to God's will or maybe consequences that are just natural in this world that is sinful. Maybe apart from our own um, doing, you know, uh, the stock market crashes, we lose a lot of money. You know, the government shuts down, our business has to shut down. Whatever it is, all right, it might be a personal defeat. But I am of the opinion that whatever my God ordains is right. And that if it has happened, it happens under the watchful care and the watchful eye of a God who will help me through it. You see, the Christian life is not without its ups and downs. But the Christian life is lived in light of a God who says, I will not leave you in the middle of your trouble. I will not forsake you. I will not let this overcome you to the point of despair and hopelessness. Because with me, there is always hope. With me, there is always a way of escape. God saved them through the fire. What a promise we have that God is watching, even though we might feel like we're drowning, even though it might feel like the pain of a fire around us. God can rescue us. God can watch over us. God will be with us in those times of trouble. God has His eye on you. You say, well, how, how is God going to help me in my time of trouble? Well, I think of a few things very briefly as I close. I think sometimes God offers us what I would call an exit. In the middle of our difficulty, in the middle of our trouble, God uh, loves us and He gives us the ability to exit. Not exit this life necessarily, but I mean exit the, the crisis. It's almost like you're going on the interstate and then you say, well, uh, here's an exit to take. And you take the exit uh, off the interstate. You're in the trouble and then God makes an exit and you're able to avoid any more difficulty or trouble. So sometimes God gives you an exit. Sometimes God gives you an encouragement. One of the things I love about our church is that we're an encouraging church. Now, it's hard to see that this morning. 
I'm looking out at empty chairs. I'm looking out at an empty auditorium where normally I would be standing uh, right up there and I would be able to look out and see different people here in the sanctuary. And I'd be able to, to know not only do I love them, but, well, at least I hope they love me. But I could feel the, 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 the tender connection with God's people. Hugging their neck, shaking their hand, just being here and talking to them and, and seeing one another, and letting them know that somebody is there with them. They might live alone, they might, uh, you know, kind of have a, a mentality about them. But you know what? When you come to a church, when you're a part of a family of God, there are no lone rangers. When you're hurting and when you need help, there are people there to help you. We don't want anybody to suffer alone. The Bible says that God's people are to rejoice with one another in times of, uh, of good times, of celebration, and we're to weep with one another during times of despair. And I want you to know that it is encouraging to me that when we are able to gather, that we can encourage one another. I'm encouraged um, just, you know, over the last few weeks as I've heard stories about how our church has been the hands and feet of Jesus within our church and outside of our church, providing meals, helping those who uh, need face masks. Uh, being uh, there for the elderly, for those that are compromised during this time, and, and being able to help them. That's encouraging. When God's work continues, it is encouraging to know that this place is a place of encouraging. It's encouraging to me to know that even in dark days, God's people step up, step into ministry, write a note, make a phone call, send an email, send a text message, drive by and honk the horn, do something. Let somebody else be encouraged that they're not alone. In our despair, sometimes God send us, sends us that encouragement that we need. In our despair, we also sometimes get some godly wisdom. We can reach out to those who uh, perhaps are students of the Word or who have lived life and who maybe have went through the same things, perhaps, that we're going through, and, and they've endured it with God's grace, and, and they can help you to say, you know what, these are some things you might be facing in the days to come, but I want to be the testimony that God has not left me. He has not forsaken me. He's not left my family, nor has He forsaken my family. I want to be a testimony that you can get through this with the Lord's help. We get wisdom and then I think also sometimes in order to overcome the defeat, we have to do something, especially men, I don't like to do. We have to reach out and we have to ask for help. And in asking for help, we are given someone else to help us to carry our burden. You know, Jesus obviously carried our burdens to the cross. But in carrying our burdens to the cross, our sin and our selfishness and all those things, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, He gives us a family, the family of God. And we too are burden sharers. Here to share in your burden, share one another's burden, to help each other not to be defeated in this life. To help keep each other above water. To help each other as we go through the fire of life to endure it. 
trust in others. Rely on the people in your life that are godly and Christ-centered to help you in times of trouble to bear your burden. I want to conclude this morning with some encouraging words from 2 Corinthians 4, 7-9. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, but yet we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we have not despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but we are not destroyed. You may lose the battle from time to time, but you will not lose the war when God, when we are on God's side. We are not defeated. I am not defeated. In God's eyes, He is watching over us. He provides for us this morning a measure of comfort that passes any understanding of this world. It is a promise that when we look to God, He redeems us, buys us from this sinful world. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus, He watches over us in a way that is caring and loving. He watches over us so that we do not succumb to the waters of this life, nor to the flame of this world. And He is with us and giving us the greatest uh, joy in this life of knowing that when we have Jesus, we don't have need for anything else. Maybe there's someone this morning who's watching and you feel defeated or in despair. I want you to hang on to those words. Hard pressed but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted, not forsaken, struck down, but you are not destroyed. Maybe you this morning feel like victory has been lost. But let me, be re let me be the one to remind you this morning. There is victory in Jesus Christ. Whatever your decision is and whatever, however God has spoken to your heart, I invite you to speak to the Lord in these moments. He can be found. You can be changed for all of eternity by what you do in these moments. Will you reach out to Him now? to close. 
Amen. Well, we've come to the end of our message and end of our service this morning. I pray that the Lord has spoken to you during this time, and I pray that you have heard His voice, and that something has uh, come into your life, something has been spoken into your heart or mind, that you'll be able to carry with you throughout the rest of this week. I want to, you to know that this church is here for you. Parkway Church is an imperfect church. We're a church where we've all made mistakes, we've all stumbled, and we've all fallen. You will not find in this church the judgment that you might find in the world. Just like the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4, we are a people whom God has decided in His providence and His grace and His mercy to offer a measure of salvation that we could not get otherwise. And by God's grace, when we heard the gospel message that we were sinners in need of a Savior, we responded. And in our responding to the call of God, we know that on that spiritual birthday, whenever that was for us, that we were saved. We were rescued. Just like the woman at the well we will thirst no more. That the spiritual need of our life has been satisfied. That that hole inside of our heart has been filled finally with something that can actually restore that peace that is missing. I often call that peace in our heart the thumbprint of God. Only God's thumbprint is unique enough to be able to satisfy our longing hearts. Oh, we fill it with a lot of other things, drugs, alcohol, sex, violence, 
the list goes on and on. Looking for anything and everything to fill that void in our heart. Friend, the only thing that can fill the void is God. And God has given His Son, Jesus, so that if you believe and trust in Him, you'll be saved. And you can be saved today. And so I'm trusting that, like all of us who at Parkway Church who have said, you know what, I am a sinner in need of a Savior, that you'll do that too. If you need help in your spiritual journey, if you have questions, if you would like to start some sort of study to, to have your questions ans asked and answered, we'll be happy to do that with you. Simply text the word DISCOVER to 703-590-5199. We'll get back in touch, touch with you. And we'll be happy to talk to you. Again, the word DISCOVER to 703-590-5199. This is Pastor Jamie looking forward to the time when we can come back together. May God bless you.